Good evening, folks. Welcome, everybody. Hope you're all having a great night. We are going to get started in just a moment. There are a few people still coming in. Uh, and if you see my attention, just go somewhere while I'm chatting. I'm just letting more folks in. I want to start off by thanking everyone for coming out this evening. We're super excited to have you out and super excited to be offering uh, this first canoe trip planning workshop. Um, I know you may have seen in the email, but I will just re-presence that we are recording this this evening. So if you don't want to be on that recording, that might get shared out to um, everyone here after the event. Feel free to turn off your camera and your face won't be on it. Um, we're going to get going in just a moment. There are some more folks coming in, but I'm going to share my screen in an instant and we will start moving through our lesson plan for the evening. I introduce myself as well. My name is Alex. Uh, the voice you heard a moment ago was Aaron. We are together the trip shed. Um, ba -ba -bum. All righty, let's get it moving. We can see the screen. Perfect. I'm just trying to move this around. Okay. The plan for the evening, we are going to go over the basics of getting your first canoe trip planned, booked, packed, and ready to go. Some things that we're going to cover tonight are choosing your first adventure, planning your route, and we're going to go through a, a bit of an in-depth reservation system demo. I know there, I heard a stat the other day that there's something like 200% increase in online reservations this year compared to last year for one of the dates, which is absolutely insane. Um, so for any folks that are on here that haven't actually gone through the reservation system yet, we're going to do a walkthrough of that uh, so that we can all get acquainted. Uh, we're going to go over some basics on the trip itself and how to pack for that. Uh, and then we'll just dip our toes into actually once you're on the trip, what to expect from your first lake, your first portage, uh, and your first campsite setup. But first, uh, a little introduction to myself and to my partner and brother, Aaron there. Um, so my name is Alex, like I mentioned, I have been guiding canoe trips now for about 12 years. Uh, we both started working together as guides when we were 16 or 17 years old at an overnight camp. And uh, we kind of had this wild idea back then to not see if we couldn't do this for the rest of our lives, which a few years ago led us to creating the trip shed. Uh, these days I work at the Guelph Outdoor School. I'm based in Guelph while Aaron lives in Toronto and I spend my time, uh, while I'm not guiding trips in the off season uh, at pretty much doing the same thing, running around the forest, hanging out with kids. And I love it. It's great. That's me in a bit of a nutshell. Aaron, you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, sure. So Aaron here, uh, the other half of the trip shed. <clears throat> Just a quick uh, overview on who we are as an organization. So we are, we're very much an experience first outdoor store. Uh, we are, are focused on getting as many folks into the outdoors safely and responsibly as we possibly can. That's why you'll see a lot of these, these really free resources come our way on how to get outside uh, responsibly, effectively, and safely, and, and to do and to have a really good time while you're doing it. Um, so that's our, our number one mission. We are also uh, an outdoor store. So we're, we're an online e-commerce gear shop. Uh, we're all, we're based in, in Ontario, uh, but that's sort of our, our, our biggest focus as well. Um, and I just also want to give a huge, huge thank you to everybody on the call. Um, we, we put this, this um, 
workshop out there two days ago, and we had over 50 registrations, which was great. I'm not sure exactly how many folks are on the call right now, uh, but I just wanted to express real gratitude to everyone for showing up. I know we live our lives on Zoom these days, and the last thing sometimes we want to do is get on another Zoom call at 7.30 at night, uh, but I hope that this is is valuable and useful for everybody. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Alexander who will take us away. Thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking like what a treat it is, you know, as much as I'm so zoomed out of screens these days to be able to hop on a Zoom call and just have bird sounds playing in the background. Uh, and to that end, I'll offer before we get started a bit of gratitude. Uh, I'm feeling really grateful today for spring springing. Um, I've been spending a lot of time outside lately and starting to notice a lot of the new birds making their way back. Uh, even just today, I saw up in the sky a flock of about 50 tundra swans making their way back north up to the Arctic where they spend their spring and summer. Uh, so I'm really grateful wow. for everything happening on the land right now. It's so exciting. And seeing people getting excited to plan their trips and to go on their trips just kind of doubles that down. So thank you all. And with that, Let's get into it a little bit. Uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about before we even get into planning your route is some broad ideas about canoe tripping. And I always love this quote because I think it really speaks to uh, the guts of what we're talking about about why we go on canoe trips. So anyone who says they enjoy portaging is either a liar or crazy because really portaging and some of the aspects of canoe trips are kind of, they kind of suck to be honest. You're hauling around heavy gear, uh, you're paddling in the rain, it's muddy, it's wet, who knows whatever the circumstances are. And for some reason, people keep going back, we keep going back, we've been doing it our entire life. So what we're gonna go over right now a little bit is um, choosing an adventure that is what you want. So the first question I'd love to pose to you and give you a second to think about is what kind of trip are you after? You know, on canoe trips, we've guided and planned a number of different kinds that range from uh, relaxing trips where you're staying on the same site for a couple of nights. Uh, some trippers that I know will really plan themselves really like almost masochistic trips where they'll try and cover these crazy amounts of ground in one day and they'll and they'll just go nuts. Um, so there's a, like kind of the two ends of the spectrum. And within that, there's so much room to play with with with. Uh, how long you want to spend at a site, how much ground you want to cover, what you want to do, what you want to see. Um, there's, you can really start to plot out like what would be a dream experience for you if you had a number of days in the backcountry. There's also the distinction that we'll just jump down a point here between front country and backcountry trips and crown land trips. But the two I want to focus on again is this 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 front country and backcountry. So front country is what's often used when we're referring to car camping. When we're talking about places that you can drive to, you don't really have to haul your gear anywhere except from your car to your campground. And besides that, everything is pretty much there. You've got amenities typically at these campsites like showers, bathrooms. Uh, a lot of them you can get, I think you're supposed to get your own firewood. Uh, it's kind of the entryway into uh, a wilderness trip. And again, on the other end of that spectrum then is the backcountry trip. And the backcountry trip essentially means anything that requires human power to get to your campsite. So typically what we're talking about here are spots where you park your car at a lake or wherever it is, however you get to the access point, and you travel either by foot, by, by canoe, by kayak, uh, and typically involves some kind of portaging as well, though not always the case. So those are some things to consider as far as when you're step, like dipping your toes into the world of camping in general is, is what do you want out of your trip um, and and how how much do you want to work for it? I guess is, a, is an interesting way to phrase the front country back country dy dynamic there. Um, obviously, things to consider as well is where are you? There are provincial and national parks spread out across uh, Ontario, and there's a lot of options to choose from. So, considering what's close to you and what how much time do you have to be able to travel to get to places that maybe aren't close to you, but that you really want to check out. Which brings us to, uh, you know, the what part question. So I'm going to just pull up another screen here just to show, like, this is a very brief snapshot of, um, pardon me, of how many parks there are in Toronto. 
or in uh, in Ontario. We've got Algonquin, Killarney, Bruce Peninsula, Quetico, Bon Echo, Point Pelee, Lake Superior, Kilbear. There's plenty to choose from. And our you know personal suggestion is make a list, start knocking them off, and check out as many as you can because they all have something unique to offer. And all have um, you know, each one either has front country only or back country or a mix of the two. So there's really a lot that you can play with there as far as uh, again what kind of camping you want to get into. Uh, something really that I, I want to stress though for you know choosing your adventure. Um, for those of you that maybe saw this this workshop in a Facebook group or heard about it from a friend, I think in the outdoor worlds there, and I've experienced this myself, I've probably done this myself, there are a lot of people that um, tend to be purists when it comes to the camping experience. And what I mean by that is that they think that the way that they do it is the way that it's supposed to be done. And what I really want to stress here is that if you're going on a canoe trip, you're going on a backcountry trip, if you're going camping, outside of breaking any rules that are set out by the park, you can really do whatever you want to do and you really have the freedom to create it and do it however you want to do it. And so my invitation to you here is when you're creating this trip for yourself, be selfish, be, if you want to bring four coolers, bring four coolers. If you want to bring all dehydrated food, bring dehydrated food and we'll get into food a bit later, but really keep yourself in mind for this trip and listen to your intuition. If something doesn't work out, you can go on another trip and try it again, but really allow yourself to craft a trip that, that you want. Um, and obviously there, there are many different ways to do that. So we can chat a bit more about that later on. Uh, but we're going to get into, you know, once you've kind of got your mind on what kind of trip you'd like, whether it's back country or front country, front country where you are. Next up is things to start considering when you're actually planning your route. So there are a number of things that we take into mind when we plan a route. Um, this is a quick snapshot of some of those things. So the first thing is considering day lengths. So I mentioned in the previous post there, there's a balance between really relaxing trips and really arduous long ground covering trips. And there's a lot of room in between. So when you're looking at a map, you can really start to um, visualize how much ground you wanna cover in a day. And inside of that, consider what you want your days to look like. If you've got a lot of ground to cover in a day, if you've got you know, several kilometers of portaging, of paddling, you're gonna to have to have an early day or you're gonna to have to risk getting into your site at night. I can't tell you how many times on trips, Aaron and I have in our early days, especially uh, miscalculated the amount of time we had to spend on the day. And uh, more than I'd like to say, pulled into our campsite well after dark um, or had to get up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning to cover that ground. So bear in mind, as far as your route goes, really cater it to the kind of trip, again, that you want to see happen. Another thing to consider there is, is what, what do you want to see? Uh, and that will be often involved by you know, what park you're going to, but there are different areas in the park that offer different landscapes. Um, some of them are, are river trips, my personal favorite. You can book routes that go around waterfalls and spend time there and combining some of these. So if you have a short day that has a waterfall stop, you've got more time to sit and relax. And I think that's one of the things that comes into what kind of trip you want and the day lengths is if you're planning a really long day, you're not going to have a lot of time to slow down and relax. And I'll, I'll give a little example here, a story that um, I often like to share. When I first started guiding, you know, the first season I was guiding, I had two guides that I learned from. And the first guide I learned from was the most by the books guide I've ever met in my life. I mean, at that point, the only guide I but he, we were up at 6 a.m. every morning. Everything that came out of the pack went right back into it. We hardly took any breaks. He was the well-oiled machine. And by machine, I mean like this almost clinical creature that there was no wiggle room for anything on our trip. And it worked really well. We covered a lot of ground. Everything was really functional. We had nothing, nothing was wrong. And that's how I learned. The next trip I went on was a very stark contrast to that because on our first lake, we had a long day and paddling that first lake about two hours in, the co-guider, my mentor at the time, looks at me and said, I'm feeling pretty tired. I had a late night last night. I'm going to pull over and take a nap. And we did. We pulled over to the side of the lake, not even at a trail, and took a nap. We got to our site that night, well after dark, 
and he had a smile on his face the entire time, mind you. We got to our site and he stands up and he, what are we gonna make for dinner? And he grabs the food barrel and the first guy to remember has everything pre-laid out, all our meals were pre-packed by meal. And the first and the second guy takes the food barrel, flips it upside down, dumps everything on the floor. And we just stood there and look at him. He's like, well, what do you want to make? And I use that, uh, that contrast to really denote the styles in which you can plan and go on a trip. Because you can be completely, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You can really be tight about everything. You can be really loose about everything. It'll work out regardless. But you can also find something in the middle that works for you. So think about that in preparation for your trip. How long did you, on, did you want to be on the water? Um, you know, what do you want your days to look like? How much freedom do you want to have to not have to worry about getting to a site at night? Uh, another piece there that we're going to talk about or that we're here is capacity. So what can you actually do? Um, I'm going to pull up a chart here right now, but uh, where is this? Think about what you, like, what, what are you a novice paddler? Um, can you paddle well? Do you have kids with you? Are you going with a friend who knows how to paddle, who knows how to trip? Is it your first time ever going? And I pull up this chart to really give some um, reference points for how ground you might be able to cover in a day based on your paddling speed, based on um, the time it takes to paddle a kilometer to portage 500 meters, and what the typical daily distance. So we can take a look here at the novice, young or out of shape paddler might be able to cover about 10 to 12 kilometers a day, whereas the experienced paddler, we're looking at 20 to 30. Again, these are rough estimates and you can really um, push yourself. You can take it super easy. But things to consider when you're planning out your route, when you're looking at the map, what can you do? Being honest with yourself. Because the last thing you want to do is bite off more than you know that you can chew and find out that when you're on the trip itself. Because it'll be a rude awakening. It'll be a good one. You'll learn from it and there's value there. But it'll likely be tough. Uh, another piece to consider in planning your route are break days. Something that I love to do on um, trips that I go on personally where, we don't, where we're not guiding. But if I'm doing a long trip, I love to plan two nights at the same site because that gives me one day to wake up, sleep in, stick my head out of the tent, put it back in a couple more times, go back to sleep, have a late breakfast, go for a paddle, go for a hike, Kind of do whatever I want and not have to worry about tearing down my site, not, worry, not having to worry about getting somewhere else on time. There's a lot of leeway. So if you're going for a trip longer than, say, two or three nights, consider a break day so that you've got space to play. You've got space to relax. You've got space to try out different styles of fire building or paddling strokes or things that sometimes when you're trying to cover a lot of ground, you don't have necessarily the luxury to devote full um presence and attention to. Last thing around this is the map layout. So I'm gonna just pull up um, something else here, but actually seeing what you're looking at on the map. Pardon me, bear with me here. So this is uh, what you're looking at right now as well. We just launched an ebook the other night and there's some really useful charts that I've been borrowing here as well but I will pull up um, the Algonquin Park New Routes. Uh, for those of you that don't have any map, maps at Algonquin Park, this is a really valuable, valuable website to check out. Um, it is on the Friends of Algonquin Park website and they've got a zoom inable map that you can really play with and visualize without having to have um, a physical paper map just yet. Although those are really great to play and look at. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a little example here. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up? Anybody who's got your screen on, if you can see my mouse hovering over. Awesome. Beautiful. So considering day lengths and considering, um, you know, visualizing this on the map. So for example, if we're looking here at Rock Lake and we've got Galeri Lake down there, Penn Lake over here. Now it can be kind of tricky um, with just looking at the lines, though these maps do have um, a scale. So you can use that as your reference point as far as, you know, how much ground you're covering in two miles. But just to, oh, where did that go? Come on, work with me there. Let's go. So from my experience, Rock Lake usually takes about an hour and a half to paddle. Using that chart again, looking at the portage, we've got a 375 meter portage. Penn Lake, 
typically about two hours or so to paddle. And now we're starting to piece together our day. We're starting to imagine if I arrive at Rock Lake at say 10 o'clock in the morning, and it takes me 45 minutes to get everything ready and get my boats on the water and get my last piece in and whatever it is, by the time I get to this portage here on Penn Lake, it could very well be two or three o'clock in the afternoon, including breaks, including lunch, including whatever the things that you wanna have as part of your trip are. So for some people that might be great, two o'clock, three o'clock. Let's say I wanna camp on one of these sites on Penn Lake. Perfect, I've got my afternoon to play with and there's no real rushing. Let's say you're staying somewhere down here on Clydegale. What this section here from rock to Penn is gonna look like is very different if you're covering more ground on your first night site. So if your first site is somewhere down here, for example, on Clyde Gale, or even if you're pushing really hard and you're coming all the way down to this little lower Dwyer, you've got more to consider. You've got a portage now that's 275 meters. You've got a longer leg to paddle. Again, that's going to make what time you start and what your day looks like a lot different. So keep these things in mind when you're looking at the map and really use that scale measure. Out. We used to just use like, you know, this motion of hand when we're looking at a paper map. It's like, yeah, that takes about an hour to cover that much ground. Um, I wouldn't suggest using that rough estimate, at least at the beginning, until you start to get comfortable with your own capacity. But this is a reference point. You know, For example, if you were staying on Louisa, this lake over here, you've got less paddling to do, but you've got this three kilometer portage. So how good are you at carrying heavy backpacks or canoes? I have no idea, but it's something to think about while you're planning out and looking at the map. Uh, another thing to consider with your route is, are you going to do a loop and in and out or one access point to a different access point? So if you're doing a loop, typically you're going to be ending at the same spot that you started from. Pardon me. So I could start at Rock Lake, for example. I could do a loop that goes down to Penn Lake, to Welcome Lake, up to Florence and Frank, up through Louisa and over back to Rock Lake. I'd end up back in my car and off I go. If I had a friend with me who maybe would drop their car at another access point, I could come from Rock Lake, travel all the way through Louisa and keep moving my way back up and end at say Smoke Lake. It's gonna largely influence how I plan my trip and how long my days are, depending again, how much ground I have to cover, where I'm ending up. And it offers more sight to see. Often on an in and out trip, you're, you're seeing the same thing on the way back out. You have a different perspective, but things to think about when again, what kind of trip do you want? And I hope that as going through some of these things, you're starting to imagine what things you could actually consider as far as what trip you kind of, what kind of trip you want. Um, so once you've got your trip in mind, so we're gonna say, for example, you know, let's do a mock-up trip here. I'm gonna start at Smoke Lake. I want an easy first day. I'd like to paddle. I wanna try portaging, it's my first time. You know, this 240 meter portage doesn't seem too hard. Perfect, I'm going to camp on Ragged Lake my first night. The next night, I wanna go nuts. I wanna push a big day. So I'm gonna camp at you know Kirkwood. I'm gonna cover a lot of ground and we're gonna go. Great, so I've got night one on Ragged, night two on Kirkwood. And let's say third night, I wanna camp on, what's the fun one? Hilliard, Hilliard Lake. So I've got my three sites and I'm gonna exit back at Smoke Lake. I'm doing a loop. I've got my access point. I've got my three nights. I know what my days look like. We're in good shape. The thing that I've heard most this year of people pulling their hairs out, as you can see, I pulled most of mine out by now, is the Ontario Parks Reservation, reservation System. For some people, it can be a nightmare. For some people, it's like doing it with their eyes closed. And if you're having to book on a morning when campgrounds open up, I can guarantee you, regardless of how well you know it, it is a nightmare so we're going to do a quick walkthrough right now of booking a campsite booking a canoe trip so i have come here to well actually before we do that i'm just gonna take a look here um i don't have the chat open so i do just want to see if there are any quick questions we'll have time for a bit more of an in-depth q a later on but if there are anything if there's anything jumping out i would love to see that right now and for some reason, my chat won't open. So we've, we've been answering questions as they come up. 
Amazing. This is perfect. Then I can just keep talking at you. This is wonderful. Keep going and we'll have uh, a discussion at the end. Okay. So reservations, the Ontario Parks Reservation Reservations website, reservations.ontarioparks.com. You land here, this beautiful scenic view. And I want to book a backcountry site. So I'm going to come down here, click on backcountry. Again, you got your option. Remember we talked about their different modes of travel in the backcountry, paddling, hiking, kayaking. So in this instance, we're doing a paddling trip. Here I've got where I can start from. So there are all the parks that you can, that offer backcountry trips will be listed out. But for this example, we're doing Algonquin backcountry. Great. I'll give you this COVID alert. I was lying there. I didn't read them all right then and there, but trust me, I have read them at some point. We are going to arrive, pick whatever day you're coming for here. We'll do say June 16th and I'm going by myself for this solo trip. It's going to ask you here what your access point lake is. And we're going on smoke, smoke lake here, but I just want to point out again, every access point lake in Algonquin park and in most parks are marked by numbers. So check an access point is basically meaning what you can drive up to and take off from. So here we've got Smoke Lake. That's our access point. Excellent. Smoke Lake, July 16th, just me, Algonquin Backcountry. So it is going to give us its own map. And each map, or this map, is going to have every lake and a triangle on every lake, a, red, a, a green or a red triangle. A green triangle indicates that there are sites available to book on that lake. A red triangle means that lake is full, no dice. So I'm gonna come here to Smoke Lake and I've chosen Ragged Lake as my first night's site. So I'm gonna hover over Ragged Lake, click on the triangle, wait for it to pop up here and I'm going to add it to my stay. Once that's added, if I scroll up, I will see here that I've got June 16th, my first night, booking location, Ragged Lake. Excellent. I'm gonna carry on with my trip. So the next night we said we're coming to, what do we say, Kirkwood. Do the same thing. Gonna hit Kirkwood there, add it to my site, and move along. I remember doing this one morning a couple weeks ago when one of the campgrounds first opened up and I, you couldn't even get the front page open. The website was jammed. Scrolling up, second night, Kirkwood. We're in good shape. And our last night, bam, 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 bam. What did we say? Hilliard, okay, this is a great example. So Hilliard, is booked. I cannot book a site on Hilliard. So I have a couple options here. I can either challenge myself and push to a longer day. I can go up here to Little Island. I can go to Tanamacoon. Bearing in mind that it'll likely add another two to three hours to my trip or to my day. I can go back and plan a completely different route. Right now, I don't want to do that. I like the route I have. I love Smoke Lake. I love Kirkwood Lake. They're great lakes. So what I might do in this instance, again, it's not available, but I might book the lake closest to me from there. So Delano Lake here. So now that this isn't available, I've got something to think about as far as how am I gonna work? And this season, I guarantee you, you're gonna have, you're gonna run into this issue a number of times because the park is filling up fast and more people are going there than ever before. So for the purpose of going through the rest of this process, I'll hit Tana McCoon, I'll challenge myself, I'll give myself a long push day, I'll have dinner at night, I'll deal with it. I'll add it to my stay, and it'll let me know, Alex, you're ridiculous, don't do this. Please don't, it's a difficult trip. It's a long distance from Kirkwood. This route should only be undertaken by experienced travelers or maniacs. Contact the park directly for any additional questions about your trip before completing this reservation. I'm gonna complete it because I just called the park. We're ready to go, I will reserve. 
And from this point, it's pretty straightforward. You click the boxes, let them know that you've read everything, carry through the dates, double check, double check, double check here. This has happened to me as a young guide where I've gotten to the park to find out that the first night was not the first night I had booked and I ended up having a 12 hour day compared to a four hour day because that's all that was available. I can guarantee you the 13 year old kids I was guiding at overnight camp back then were not pleased about it. And I was not pleased to have to deal with that day. So double, triple, quadruple check your route. If all looks clear, go ahead and book, proceed to checkout. Read that and pay. You'll get a confirmation email that you are all set to go and your trip is booked. Whew. And now the fun stuff. Now hey, it's it. to start. Yes, please jump in. Oh, I, I want to make a note here uh, about overbooking um, because it was a question that was asked and it's a really, really important point, especially for folks who are going on their first backcountry trips this year. Uh, I had someone reach out to me a little while ago uh, after the, the long weekend bookings, uh, looking for outfitting. And they told me that, yeah, we're doing a canoe lake loop. Um, you know, we wanted to do canoe to Sunbeam to Joe, but Joe is all booked up. So we're just going to stay on Sunbeam two night, for two nights, even though we couldn't get a reservation for two nights on that lake. Basically saying they're going to stay on a lake without a reservation. So, so we, we chose to not outfit them. Yes, no is right. We chose to not outfit them because that is a, a really terrible attitude to have uh, and a very dangerous thing to do because we we've been in that situation before we've been in that situation where we've gotten to a site and there's nothing available right we had a, we had actually one particular uh instance when my brother and i landed on a lake at night it was just the two of us so we were okay traveling at night and it was on it was on Lake Louisa, so a, a big lake. Um, and looking for a site at night, everything was was booked up. Uh, there was one site on the lake, and we had sites literally uh, like the Titanic guide us in with their flashlights. They saw us on the lake and they pointed us in. So please, 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 when you book sites, uh, do do stick to your reservations, especially in the busy season, but always, um, because you never know who's going to show up there late at night and need that site. That's all. There's another story I'll share there. Uh, this was on a guided trip again years ago that we got to a lake and there wasn't an available site. We paddled to every site as the sun was coming down and there were no empty spots. By the time we had checked the last campsite, it was already dark and we didn't have the energy left to go back and start this awkward conversation of like, Hey, can I check your permits? I know this is kind of awkward. We just, we had no gas left in the tank. So gratefully, 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 the last site that we stopped at offered us a spot to stay. And we picked our tank in the back forest and everything worked out after all. But the note there is yes, don't overbook. Stay on your, on your, on your permitted sites. And if somebody comes to you in distress, be kind. It makes a big difference. And that's just good to do. Um, let's see. Yeah, exactly, Ray. There definitely can be kids on a group. Okay, that, that was the instance that we're talking about here. Sharing is caring. Absolutely. Okay. We are going to get into packing right now. So when I pack for a trip, I think about it in three areas. I think about it in food. I think about it as my house, and I think about it as my utilities or my kitchen, largely the things that help me cook the food. And I've found that by thinking in these three categories, it happens a lot quicker and there's very little guesswork. Because ultimately on a trip, you're traveling with nothing but yourself, with the gear that you bring and the people that you bring with you. Outside of that, you've got nothing. And thankfully on a canoe trip, you don't really need a lot. This is one of the beauties of traveling by canoe and traveling in the backcountry, is that it's just you and it's just nature and all you have to do is survive and enjoy what's around you. You're not bringing your laptop. I mean, I hope not, you might, but personally, I don't like to. 
So making sure that you've got the necessities of life really allows you to immerse yourself in the experience of what's around you. The larger context of the trip. So we're gonna start off with food. What and how? There is a lot of talk and a lot of um, points of view and pros and cons to how to pack food and what food to pack. I love to eat well on trips and I know most people that camp love to eat well. There are creative ways to do it. This picture here, uh, our father growing up used to make a dish called pasta al forno. And it was a baked pasta dish that you would, you would coat in cheese and, and sauce and you put it in the oven. And at the end of the oven, uh, at the end of its cooking time, you would broil it at the top and you would get this like crunchy, burnt, crispy layer. It was so delicious. So we managed to figure out a way to do this on a trip where we covered our pot with coals and we put this whole pasta layered system in there. And it was probably the best meal I've ever had in my entire life. So you can bring fresh food. You can bring fruits, you can bring vegetables, you can bring steaks, you can bring chicken, you can bring whatever you want. But bear in mind that once you're out there, all you have is a food barrel or potentially a cooler, but you have no way to keep things cold and you are most likely carrying it at some point. So there are options here. You can bring dry food where you're bringing rice and oats and things like that. You can bring dehydrated meals where your entire produce, meat, whatever it is, is severely lowered in weight because it's been dehydrated. You can make these at home. I know one hack that I often do uh, of just using my oven, I don't actually have a dehydrator. But I'll just crack my oven door, set it at 150 for like six hours and whatever I've got dehydrates. And you can also buy really, it's come a long way, really delicious dehydrated dinners, breakfast, lunch, snack. A couple of years ago, I had um, a dehydrated ice cream sandwich. It was awful, don't get it, but it, it exists. One thing I do like to do though, is to pre-plan out my meals. And I found that over the years, this has taken out a lot of guesswork. When we were younger and guiding big groups, and we kind of packed from this like massive box of whatever we were packing from outside of produce. And we weren't great at measuring out what we actually needed to bring. I always found that I ended up feeling more full and heavier on trips than I wanted to. So how we fix this and how we've addressed this is by pre-planning our meals. And that could look like, you know, figuring out, sitting down with a meal plan. What do I want for breakfast, lunch, dinner? What do I want for snacks? And actually portioning them out in a little baggie, setting them aside. And the benefit there too is that when you get to that night, you pull out dinner night one, great, ready to go. Everything's in there with your vegetables, with whatever it is, um, your rice, your mac and cheese is great. And that brings to the point of, of wait, 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 wait. I don't want to carry all this. It's so heavy. I'll tell you another story. This was years ago. And my brother and I were on a trip where we brought, we were planning a two week trip and we brought what we thought was enough food, what ended up being the most food I've ever seen anyone bring on a canoe trip to the point that for the first week, we could not carry the food barrel. We both had to work together to carry it. It was ridiculous. We had a bag this big of mac and cheese powder, of quinoa, of, 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 pasta of rice it was absolutely insane and we didn't know what to do we had way too much food gratefully that afternoon we met some folks on a trip who were coming back in at an access point like we were traveling past an access point like and by the grace of god we had a chat we showed them our sore ripped up shoulders long story short they agreed to take out some of our food for us and bring it back i don't know what they did with it but we had to ditch a bunch of our food and these folks helped us out the lesson there was pre-plan your meals and don't bring too much but don't bring too little it's a sweet spot and you might have to try it a couple of times to find that sweet spot for yourself i find these days myself i don't like to overeat on trips i don't like to feel stuffed especially on the next day when i have to carry stuff and i got a haul gear around but i need energy you need energy so keep these things in mind the last point i'll make there is you know dealing with your food Cool, I'm pulling it down because I can't. Coolers, critters, and cooked meals, keeping this stuff cool and airtight. So there are a number of options for packing systems with your food. You can grab a food barrel. Those are great. Airtight lid, no scent, 
hard plastic. You can really jam things in there. I've seen people that will put their food into scent proof uh, dry sacks and throw them in their own personal packs. I've seen folks that use what's called wanigans, which are essentially just wooden boxes that you fall on your shoulders. Uh, I think they have value. I've never tried them myself, but from my understanding, they seem to work. Uh, keeping things cool is tricky though. And I've definitely had trips where I've brought steaks or chicken breasts on the first day. And by the third day, they've still managed to keep cool. And what we've learned, and this is a great tip, is they actually have and carry these um, food barrel coolers, which are these small round coolers that I would suggest throwing a freezer pack into and then throwing whatever, keep, uh, whatever food you really want to keep cold in and then burying that in the middle of your food barrel and surrounding it with everything else, with your dry food, with your other produce that you know doesn't need to stay, won't, won't go rancid. And they'll act as an insulation piece. When you're on the water, you might throw you know, a jacket over top of the food world to try and keep it in the shade a bit. At night, it'll cool back down. There are all these different little ways of um, managing your food so that it does stay as cool as possible. And again, there comes back the balance between dry and wet food. The more, when I, when I say wet food, I mean fresh produce, I mean meat, I mean cheese, I mean things like that. Um, the more wet food you have, the more you're going to have to think about how you're going to keep it cold, when you're going to eat it, balancing it out. Usually we'll try and keep, you know, steaks and, and chicken and whatever it is, fish on the first few days of the trip and save things like dried meat, salami, pastas for the end of the trip. Consider these things when you're planning out what to eat and how to eat it. I'm just checking in on the chat here again. Yeah, and you know there there are thank you no for mentioning that there are totally um, options like the you know the the rat sack or the ear sack where they claim to be bear proof and scent proof bags. Uh, I'm not going to say any of them are 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 true. I haven't tried them yet, um, but I will say that I've heard stories of folks that have used things like this and have had bears and critters get into them. I've had the smell get out. So my suggestion here as you know, somebody who's been doing this for years are to use the things that are tried and true. That said, nothing is ultimately tried and true. If a bear finds your food barrel and really wants it, he's going to find a way to get it. He's a bear. He's been living out there for years. He probably knows how to deal with this better than you do. But there are ways to avoid that, like finding things that are scent proof, like not leaving food around the site, not leaving your food scraps in the fire pit, or the thunder box, really tending to your food system as if you were, I actually don't even have a metaphor, just tend to it well, keep it tight. Um, yeah, great tips, you know, ketchup packets, these kinds of things. There are ways that you can really um, ensure that whatever food you're bringing is is, uh, is tight and crafted to suit your trip, for example. You know, taking back a couple of steps. If you're planning a trip where you've got two days on the same site, you might bring an extravagant meal to cook. If you've got a trip where you're covering lots of ground all day, dehydrated meals is probably the best way to go because it's quick, it's easy, it doesn't weigh a lot, and off you go. Um, one last thing I will say, and this is also a topic for debate, is dealing with food at night. So it actually typically, I mean, it does happen, but I think usually when it comes to dealing with, uh, you know, critters and, and, you know, bears at night with food, more often than not, it's like raccoons, squirrels that are trying to get your food than a bear. Depends where you're at and bears still come forward sometimes, but I usually don't worry about bears as much as I try to, to guard against little, little, little hungry critters. So there are ways to deal with this at night. You can use a bear hang, definitely works. You can use, um, I've seen somebody, I wouldn't suggest this, but people sometimes put their barrels in boats and string up and let the boat drift off into the water. That strikes me as ridiculous. If your boat gets lost in the middle of the night, you have a hell of a morning ahead of you. Um, typically what we do, we'll either hang it or you hang it off a tree or I'll just walk my barrel you know, 100 meters into the forest, 200 meters into the forest, 
set it on the ground, and leave it there and keep it away from my sight. Because if critters do come around, if a bear comes around, he's going to get in there. And I don't want him to mess around with my tent or anything else. So things to think about. Uh, we're going to move along here. So your house, this is your staying cozy pack. Things you need to be comfortable, like your tent, your clothing, your sleeping bag, your sleeping pad. And this is how we do this. I'm going to lay out our standard packing list for clothing. And how we break clothing down is in wet clothes and dry clothes. So think about it like this. Dry clothing are the clothes that you have at night. They're the clothing that you, by all means necessary, you want to keep uh, dry. Your cozy sweatpants, your warm wool socks, your, your big hoodie, whatever you're going to wear around the campsite and go to sleep with. Your wet clothes are, day, are clothing that you're wearing during the day that might very well likely get wet. If it rains, if your canoe takes a dump, if you go for a swim, whatever it might be, you'll likely have a raincoat and rain pants on, but you can protect against everything. So this would be, you know, a pair of lightweight hiking pants, uh, maybe a synthetic shirt, a rain jacket, a pair of hiking boots that you'll probably get wet when you're getting in and out of the boat. And I do whatever I can by all means necessary to keep my dry clothes dry. So that's keeping them in a dry sack. That's keeping them, pardon me, I'm just trying to find this, this packing list here. Um, and that's really it. It keeps it tight. It keeps it. It keeps it straightforward as far as what you. Here we are. Uh, in, th in terms of how you pack, so you don't overpack. So the wet clothing, again, you know, a lightweight shirt, sports bra, rain jacket, hiking pants, good shoes, rain pants, and that's what you'll wear. Maybe you might want to bring a change, but you're gonna get stinky on a trip. It's gonna happen. I usually just bring one T-shirt to wear during the day. I wear it throughout the days. You can take your choice around that. Again, dry, a cozy toque to wear at night, another t-shirt, a sweatshirt, maybe some long johns, a pair of sweats, a pair of socks, and you're all set. Inside your house pack too, we're gonna go things that you need, um, kind of the, the, the household items that aren't around cooking. So things like your flashlight and headlamp, your toothbrush and toothpaste, the toothpaste, by the way, should go in your food barrel at night. Maybe a towel, maybe you're bringing a camera or a phone, so a power bank, whatever hygiene products you might need, a notebook, a book, a camera. Keep that in your personal pack. That's what we do at least. It keeps all the things that I need to access that I want in close proximity right there with me. And the last thing is our utility pack. And this is like the all the things that make the site itself tick. So these are like my packs, but these are also you know, the stove and fuels, my cookware and utensils, forks and knives and spatulas, a big pot, maybe a little pot, a pen, my cutlery, um, a pot gripper, lighters, matches, my water purification system, whether that's a pump or tablets, kitchen cleaning supplies, scrubby, some, some biodegradable soap, teepee. I usually hide teepee in every pack I've got because I've had, I won't even get into that. Uh, flashlight, water bottles, first aid kit, insect repellent, and a tarp. That is it. As far as my packing system goes, that's all we've got. House, kitchen, and utilities. And at a certain point, once you get this nailed down and once you really, you know, what we often suggest doing is before we trip, unlaying all your stuff on the ground, looking at it, maybe taking away what you don't need, but getting comfortable and getting memorized almost with what you've got, and where you've got it. And eventually at a certain point, You'll know where every single piece of gear is at all times without even having to think about it. Big pot, bottom of the U-pack. Headlamp, top of my personal pack. It'll become like clockwork. And it's these things that come become like clockwork that I think are essential to making a trip run because there are things that happen on trips that are uncertain, that throw a curveball at you. And we're going to get into that in, in, in a few minutes, but making sure you got everything laid out and, and, and you've got it all in your mind, ready to go. Um, a quick note on actually getting your campsite set up. So you've traveled all day, you've done your portage, you've done your first lakes, you got your, you're at your site for the first night and you're pulling up. What do you look for? How do you set things up? Similar to front country camping in your approach in some ways, 
but I, I, my, my thought process is a bit different here. So when I pull up to shore to a site, I immediately hop out of the boat, I run up to the site and I look around. What I'm checking for is, is there flat ground for a tent? If I have several people, is there flat ground for enough tents? Are there trees to tie my tarp onto? You know, are those trees near the fire pit? How far away are the closest trees? Do I have enough ropes for that? Where is the thunder box? Um, things like that that you know help me orient myself to what I'll have to do to get comfortable and get set up and get my home built quick. Because that's essentially what a trip is. You are tearing down and rebuilding your home every day if you're traveling that day. So the event sequence that I'll pull up here for you real quick around um, getting to your site is typically straightforward. I get to the site, I pitch my tent, I string up my tarp, I roll out my sleeping bags and sleeping pads, so that everything's laid out and ready to get into. I collect my firewood and I get cooking. This is for a great weather day. And I say that because your sequence of events at your site will shift based on your circumstances. If I get to a site and all of a sudden it starts thunderstorming, I'm not sitting on my tent in the storm. That's going to suck and it's going to be wet. I'm probably stringing up a tarp right away. I might later on, if it's still raining, set up my tent under the tarp and then move it over somewhere else once the rain flies on. If it's starting to trickle, I might grab firewood right away so I can get whatever dry wood I can find. If I'm starving, I might have a snack first. But there are certain things that need to happen in order for this to become a house, like a tent, a tarp, my cozies, a fire, and a meal. Outside of that, you can play with it. You can shift them around based on what you need to do. In the morning, it's basically those things in reverse. I usually do my tent first or last. Um, sorry, I usually do my tent uh, first as I'm packing up my packs and will likely do the tarp last in case it starts to pour rain. I got a place to crash out and hang out for a bit. And on the water, we go add to our next site. Bear hangs we touched on. There's a big debate in the hole. It's, it's crazy. Anyway. And here are the things that I'm, I'm really excited to chat about. Because what we just went over, actually, you know, before we do that, I, I'm curious if there are, I'm just going to check the, um, the chat if there are any questions based on, I know that was a lot of info dumped at once. And uh, yeah, nothing pressing I'm seeing here. We'll save a question and answer period for the end. But these are the things that I think at TripShed we're really pumped about talking about. The things that happen beneath the layer of the canoe trip, the deeper cuts of what traveling is. And there are certain broad ideas that we love to talk about that happen on a canoe trip that exist in the context of backcountry wilderness travel that I think are so beautiful. Because really, in a vacuum, everything you do on a trip is just one thing. What's well, everything in life? You're just paddling. You're just building a fire. You might know how to build a fire. You're just setting up a tent. You might already know how to do that. You're just tying up a tarp. You might already know knots. Each skill on its own has less meaning than everything together as once. Because really what you're doing, and this is what I like to set context on our trips, is you are in many ways going away and coming home. And what I mean by that is when you're going on a canoe trip or you're going on a backcountry adventure, you are going away from your day-to-day -day life, you're going away from your schedule, you're going away from the city, you're going away from it all to get away. And that's great. We need that. As humans, we have to, especially lately when the world is doing what the world is doing, you got to unplug, you got to take off for a bit, you got to run away for a few days and go play in the woods. But you are also coming home. And what I mean by that is this mode of travel, this way of living in particular, is something very fundamental to the human experience. You go back thousands of years, this is how we lived. The people that lived and lived this land, that stewarded the land, the indigenous communities that have lived here forever, humans before that, there is something innate in our system that knows how to be in the wild, how to travel like this. We are carrying what you need to live, the people you need to live with, and that's the broader context of the trip that I love so much because it really is this, this unit of experience that you can't get anywhere else. It's just you, it's just the wilderness, and it's all you've got for a number of days. 
And there's something again in our in our human system that knows how to move. If you walk barefoot on the land for long enough, I guarantee you something will recall how to move barefoot on that land. When you sit around a fire, something in you wakes up because humans have been sitting around fires for thousands of years. And so my invitation to you in going on your first backcountry trip is to think about that. To look for the things that come naturally. And it might feel it might feel awkward at first. That's okay. We for people that haven't done this before. It's scary, it's foreign, it's not, it in many ways seems unsafe. And by doing all the things we talked about before, you know, I once heard this definition of adventure as uh, adventure is a journey with an uncertain outcome. And I was talking to somebody once and he shared, he's like, you know, I don't like that idea of adventure. Adventure for us is being as certain as you can about as many things as possible and then getting that things will probably go awry at some point, but you have prepared. And that brings me to adapt and improvise. Why we stress packing, safety, you know, knowing first aid, making sure all your gear is laid out, making sure your route has been triple checked because you wanna have as little to think about if something happens as possible. Because inherently things happen in the backcountry that we can't predict. Storms, boat tips, lose a paddle, it breaks, they're bound to happen. I can guarantee you there's not been a trip I've been on in my life where some curveball wasn't thrown. And the most crucial skills I've learned throughout my years as a guide have not been how to tie a tarp up in 10 seconds. They've not been how to start a fire with a snap. They've not been how to read maps. They've been how to adapt and improvise to whatever situation comes up. How to take what you've got and change it into something else based on what else you have with you. But more than that, it's a, it's a, cont it's a perspective shift. I think the biggest thing that we can adapt and improvise with is our mood and our approach to life. You can be standing in the middle of a set of rapids. There's a picture we put up on our social media recently, recently of Aaron on a trip with his friends years ago with a canoe sunken in the river wrapped around a rock. Totally gone. And he had this huge smile on his face. I think that's so beautiful. Adapting to whatever the situation brings. It's like, yeah, okay, the boat's in the water. The boat's going to be in the water whether I'm screaming about it, whether I'm laughing about it and grabbing the camera to take a picture. It's going to pour rain. It's going to storm. It's going to happen regardless. And the choice is up to us whether or not we want to allow ourselves to the whole quote, whether you want to get wet or feel the rain. And I want to get wet and play. So I invite you to take that on when something inevitably goes uh, wrong, when something inevitably challenging happens. And this is what I mean by bringing meaning to our trips. Thinking about these things that, you know, what, what is it for you? What edge are you pushing? Why are you even trying to port? Like, why are you portaging? What, what is your edge of comfort? And what is pushing past that mean for you? And then thinking again that like you can always broaden these contexts that we're, we're traveling in a place that is held by the land. We're traveling in a way that we're being held by the land, the, by the waters. Um, and this like in this, in this, I lost my train of thought there. But to bring meaning to your trip is to make it more than just a walk in the park. It's to make it something powerful that will probably leave impacts for you that will, long, will last long after you've left the park. And those for me have been the things that have changed my life time and time again. And I invite you to let those be the same things for you. And give gratitude to the land. It supports you. That water holds you. That land is where you pitch your tent. Those trees live there year round. Those animals live there year round. So please, please, please leave no trace on your trips. And there are many resources around to look up, you know, leave no trace concepts how to trip in ways that allow you to leave no garbage. But the thing that I'll say to that is you know, to leave it better than you found it, which is in, in some cases, we'll get to a site and there'll be tin foil left in the, in the fire pit or garbage strewn around or you know, a rope tied around a tree that's been strangled by this rope. And if you can help, if you can tend the land, it's tending to you by letting you be there, by, by holding you. So do what you can to... Not only leave no trace, but go beyond that and leave it better than you found it. It'll be a gift for you and people to come. They can travel in this pristine wilderness 
that we all love to be in. So with that, I will wrap this up. Thank you so much for following along. And I'm going to open the floor for, for questions. And, and the last thing I'll say is that, you know, canoe tripping for us, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Uh, the experience of tripping has been the most rewarding thing that we've done in our lives. Um, we built this entire business around it and, and it's, it's such a dream. So I invite you to, to join us in that. And, and by that, I mean, whenever you go on a trip to think about some of these deeper thoughts that we're talking about and see if it can't give you the same gift that it's given us. With that, I am complete on the presentation. Aaron, if you've got any things you'd like to add in there, otherwise we'll get into some questions if there are any and That'll be that for our evening. Right at 8.30. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I've been like firing things off in the chat uh, the whole time. So uh, nothing major to add. Uh, thank you for that, Alexander. Thank you again, everybody else for coming. Um, if there are any questions, comments, concerns, or anything else, feel free to either drop them back in the chat or, or mention them mention them here. Uh, the, the last question that I was asking, I'll just quickly talk about that. And if you guys got to pop off, it's totally cool. Feel free to do that. Um, but a question was asked about uh, sort of most common uh, things overlooked in the in the back country. Um, my, my answer there, um, and something that we talk a lot about here is is the ability to manage risk and i think being a level of self-awareness is the the most important thing and something that can be often overlooked when going into the back the country uh, is is knowing your own skills uh, and understanding what you can and cannot do and assessing situations as such um, whether that's scouting out a set of rapids and deciding to not, definitely not run those rapids because you're in an ultralight Kevlar rental canoe or or anything else that might come up around storms or or, or bear hangs or every, literally every part of the trip uh, to be very mindful of what is the risk associated with that, uh, what, what could happen, and if something does happen, am I equipped to handle that situation? Um, yeah, I could keep rambling on about that, but I won't. I've seen, I've seen some good uh, questions. Easy. I'm gonna check the chat there. Mm -hmm. Easy park for beginners, Kawartha, Frontenac, Bon Echo. Um, all parks have different routes. Uh, Kawartha is is a, a personal favorite. My wife and I uh, were there last year and love it. Uh, you've got some, some beautiful sites. Depends where you're at and how far you wanna drive and where you wanna go. Uh, Frontenac is, is harder than you'd anticipate. Uh, Alexander and I led a trip of 80 uh, grade eight students through Frontenac two years ago. Yeah. Um, if you want specific uh, routes, happy to, to share any of those, but, but do, do love uh, Kawartha, uh, do love Bon Echo, and do love Algonquin for sure. Um, the route that Anya I this question a lot. here as well um, is great for that question for a beginner beginner route. Uh, definitely the Canoe Lake, Smoke Lake area is really well maintained um, and is traveled off and is cleaned up often. So Smoke to Parkside Bay, um, you can push it depending on how long you want to be out. You can maybe spend a couple of nights. Canoe Lake, Little Doe or Joe Lake, you can head up through Burnt Island to Sunbeam Lake and come back down around Tom Thompson and TP Lake. Um, really, really great spots, especially as a beginner. If you are a bit nervous, you can almost guarantee you'll see other folks around. So, you know, you're never, you're not too, too isolated. Whereas park places in northern parts of the park, uh, there's a lot of folks, around, there's less, a lot less folks around. Um, the question there on pack sizes, uh, again, that that is relative. Um, I've seen 75 liter and 115 liter too. We personally bring 115 liter standard for our trips because you can roll them down and you can, you can, you can cut off that space. It's a bit stiffer at the top, but I'd rather have too much space and be able to compress it and not enough space and have my sleeping bags get soaked in the middle of the trip. And this is kind of the reference point I use for when I'm packing packs and when I'm doing things is like, what would I imagine here if my entire canoe was thrown into the into water? Is everything as airtight as it can be? Is everything 
um, stashed away properly? Is my food barrel secure? So I would say get the 115 personally. Um, and, you know, better to be safe than sorry when you're in the back of the tree and three days away from help or a dry place to sit. Um, Calvin uh, asking about a good wilderness first aid course provider online or in person. So uh, there, there's a bunch of really great providers out there. Um, in our quest to be able to empower as many folks to get outdoor safely as possible, apart from guiding and outfitting and, and gear, uh, we were working on internally uh, with a, a provider who's licensed through the, by the Canadian Red Cross on putting together a joint uh, wilderness first aid or advanced first aid or research course uh, for late April, May. Um, so you can reach out to us if you want. We can send you details if you'd like. Uh, if not, there are, are plenty of other really great providers. I see NOAA's taking one with MHO. They're awesome as well. Um, yeah, there's plenty of other organizations out there, but I can send you details on that as well if you'd like. And I, I will just say too, I mean, even if you're not working as a guide getting some degree of first aid, uh, especially wilderness first aid, is such a valuable thing to bring into the backcountry with you. Um, there are things, you know, I think the distinction for wilderness first aid is that standard first aid is designed based on, you know, the ambulance showing up within a matter of minutes. In the backcountry, you are the ambulance. You, in some cases, are the emergency doctor for a few days. So the more you can equip yourself, again, takes less uncertainty out of situations that will likely arise at some point. So, you know, do what you can to prep, even if you don't take a full course, there are books you can buy to read, bring it with you in case something comes up. Um, and just, you know, as much as you pack your gear, pack yourself as well. Um, are there any other questions as we wrap this up? If there are, throw them in the chat. If not, if they come to mind after, please do feel free to reach out. To, I'll throw our email into the chat here right now, info at the tripshed.ca. Um, give us a shout. We'd love to chat. Uh, I will just say as well that we are offering this summer um, a number of workshops happening on canoe trips. So something that we're excited about uh, at Tripshed this season is using canoe trips as uh, a canvas or medium to deliver other information. So for example, we've got a trip coming up in June um, and throughout the, several throughout the season. Uh, these wilderness workshops where we'll actually be doing education focused trips where we're teaching you all the things and more that we went over here this evening on a canoe trip. We've got a trip running it's like a bushcraft survival skill so there's there are things that we're excited to offer and if you want more information on those you can head to our site. Um, we did also just a couple of days ago launch put the site in there as well. Um, we launched an ebook that is the that was what's what I, what's was what I was scrolling through. Um, to pull up some of these things. So uh, the more in-depth version and the actual written out lists are available on our site there. Uh, it's the ultimate guide to a backcountry adventure. So feel free to give that a look as well if you want a deeper cut into some of these things. Other than that, I think we're uh, I think we're pretty much good to wrap it up. Before we do, I just want to thank again everybody so much for coming out tonight. Um, one of the things that excites me the most by having this many people on the call is that while there are a lot of new people coming back into the park uh, this season, there is an intention there to do it well and to do it safely and to do it in a way that uh, honors the land, honors our trips, honors our trippers. So thank you all for coming out tonight and really taking a stand for. Uh, a rich, beautiful season of canoe tripping. I hope to see you all on the trail, uh, see you all on the lakes, and um, yeah, stay dirty, get after it. And with that, thank you. We will close the call. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the night. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great night and see you out there.